Um, so tonight we are talking to um, Tiziano DeSena specifically about um, his book, Sunny Days and Sleepless Nights. It's a book of poetry. So um, I'm going to be doing a Q&A with Tiziano. And uh, as we go along, Tiziano will read um, his poems in Italian and then in English. Um, for those of you uh, that are not familiar um, with Tiziano, uh, I'm just going to um, read a bio, very short bio here uh, for you. Um, Tiziano DeSena was born in Milan and is the son of artist Emilio Giuseppe DeSena. Tiziano has won numerous awards and nominations for poetry, journalism, and fiction in Italy and the U.S., and his works have appeared in over 100 magazines and anthologies. Tiziano is the editor-in-chief of two magazines founded in Yonkers, Opera My Love and Opera More Mio, and he is the founder and editorial director of Idea Magazine, and he's been the editorial director of that since 1990. Um, Tiziano has um, done now a, a few programs with us. Um, the first program that he's done with us is about his book, The World as an Impression, The Landscapes of Emilio Giuseppe de Sena, uh, which focused on his uh, father's artwork. Um, so that's, that's available to view. On YouTube. He also did a program with us about the importance of uh, writing a memoir, and that's also uh, on YouTube. Um, he has done, uh, or he's edited um, a collection of short stories um, by Italian Americans, and that's called the Feast of Narrative um, series. It's in, well, it's in three volumes. Um, so those are a few of his um, other works. So, uh, but again, tonight the program will be focused specifically on uh, sunny days and sleepless nights. So, welcome, Tiziano. Thank you. Um, uh, just one correction on the bio: I am not the founder of Lidea Magazine. I don't want to take credit for something I did. Oh, okay. I'm Sorry. just the, the, the editorial director since 1990, and okay. I've been writing for longer than that. The founders are actually uh, people, friends of mine uh, in Brooklyn. I used to live in Brooklyn at the time, and uh, some of them went to high school with me at the time. So those were the founders. They are not either than one of them, who is uh, the editor in chief. Uh, they are not around anymore with the activities of the magazine. Okay, all right, thank that you. That was in 1974, so it's a while back. <laughs> okay, um, all right. I'd like to um, yeah ask you some questions about this collection. Sure. Um, so. Uh, see well i think what i'll do is i'll i'll bring up the uh the powerpoint first so then because that has the text of the poems and then i'll ask you questions as we go along so i'm going to share my screen right now so just bear with me a moment okay and okay so this is the cover of the book obviously um in your intro, um, you describe poetry as emerging from the desire to share feelings. Um, these poems are obviously very personal. And in the preference, Linda Ann uh, Lashavo writes of your verse having an openness, frankness, and vulnerability that few artists could match. Uh, when writing poems, do you sometimes find yourself emotionally overwhelmed or do you have more of a detachment? And do you see either one as a hindrance? Well, the truth is that when I compose a poem, I'm always emotionally overwhelmed. That is actually the trigger that makes me write. My poem writing has been a safety valve that releases the exploding feelings within me. I cannot be detached from poetry writing because it is the essence of me finding a channel to be heard, to exist in a different dimension. On that topic, I'd like to read a poem that describes, if ever so concisely, the process of writing a poem. I will read it first in Italian because that's how it was composed. And I will put my eyes on for that process. The poem is titled La Quinta Dimensione. 
scoprirsi a rubare emozioni da cuori travagliati, studiando riflessi di luna sul fondo di un vecchio bicchiere, trattenendo il respiro per poter udire il proprio pulsare. Vivere nella quinta dimensione, con un piede nella porta, un foglio di carta e una matita. Osmosi di idee, travaso di belle parole, un'altra poesia si è reincarnata. The fifth dimension. To find yourself stealing emotions from troubled hearts, studying moon reflections on the bottom of an old glass, with bathed breath so as not to hear your heartbeat. Living in a fifth dimension with a foot in the door, a sheet of paper and a pencil. Osmosis of ideas, transfer of beautiful words, another poem, poem was reincarnated. So that, that is how I always felt my, poets, my poems were born uh, with the, all these ebullient emotions that needed to find a channel to uh, connect to the rest of the world. That's basically it. Then there never, there never is a, uh, a detachment from a poem. Unlike it could be with the, when you write essays or you write short story. I'm curious, uh, I found this when I've been writing fiction. Um, do you find yourself uh, when you're writing poetry, um, it's almost as if you go back, uh, it's almost as if you're, you're for that brief amount of time, you're living in that, that memory or, um, you know, you feel like you've, you're outside of the space that you're in writing? Uh, well, yes, you are, when you, when you are, while you're writing, first of all, you are encapsulated. That's why I call it the fifth dimension. You are in a world all of your own. It's not uh, the world, the real world that surrounds you. You are absorbed by your own feelings who, that need to come alive on the paper. So mm -hmm. you, you live in, in a completely different world. Yeah. It is at times uh, similar in fiction when you write, not so much when you write essays because that's more academic, but when you write um, novels mm. and um, you feel for one of the characters. One of the characters has um, some of the characteristics that uh, were dictated by you. So it may be similar to you or it may be similar to someone who you loved or you care for. And when you are writing and when you're reading back about that particular character, yes, you are absorbed by it. And yeah. uh, that's that's the creation of uh, of an opera of works of written works of any kind that pull your soul out. It's not only words; it's what you feel. So that's more so in poetry, but it is also sometimes in novels or short stories. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there a poem or arrangement of poems in this collection that that brings back uh, particularly vivid memories? Well, all of them when read will bring back vivid memories. Some of them have a stronger impact on me. The book is divided into sections that reflect the condition that somehow forced me to write a particular poem. The sections are tormented love, love in its simplicity, observation on life, the anguish of existence, and sleepless nights, which is the English uh, poems section. I would say that Poems that belong to the anguish of existence section reflect more my dark moments when I was fighting internal conflicts that I felt at the time were insurmountable. An example of that type of poetry can be found in the poem, A Poet's Death, which brings me back to the period when my father passed away and I had a terrible, terrible time to accept. He made me stop writing poetry for quite a few years, actually. And I actually will read from that poem, and I am not 100% sure if the, re the listeners will capture what's behind the poem itself. That's, the poem is titled Morte di un Poeta, A Poet's Death. You can, yeah, there it goes. 
Tra le chine erbose e lievi che popolano il dolce mondo della felicità, striscia la serpe, pronta a colpire. Non so che direzione prendere. Il dolore sconosciuto non ha dimensione, annienta. Sull'orlo del baratro, con l'orrido sapore del fiele che pervade la bocca di sensi, apprezzo il vento fresco della vita. Un peso sordo è ritornato a soffocarmi l'anima. Mi chiedo perdono. A poet's death. In between the mild and grassy knolls that inhabit the sweet world of happiness, slithers the snake, ready to strike. I don't know which direction to take. The unknown pain has no dimension. He annihilates. On the brink of the abyss, with the horrible taste of gold that pervades the mouth and the senses, I appreciate the fresh wind of life. A dull weight has returned to choke the soul. I ask myself forgiveness. The reason I had asked myself forgiveness is because I knew at that moment that I could never, after that poem, write again any more poems. And that lasted for more than 20 years. So I would say that uh, uh, in that case, the death of my father um, took away a lot of the need to put in writing my feelings. I was numb for a long time. And um, maybe because my father was never sick, you know, until he died, basically. So it was a shock. So. But that, this is why uh, the anguish of existence, and there's some more poems in, in that section, which uh, give you the feeling of a person who has uh, troubles in which we all do, you know, uh, or facing particular situations, you know, depending on the cut. In this case, it's, uh, it's uh, the death of, uh, of the father, but um, I also wrote a poem about um, a puppy that uh, I had found and um, rescued and died right in front of me, hit by a car. So similar kind of uh, situation which gives you angst, we give you anxiety and uh, make you feel that. So that's basically how I felt. Oh, is there a poem that you feel you didn't get the recognition that you'd hoped for? <sighs> well, Although a poet publishes a book or participates to a contest, when he does that, he tends to want some type of recognition, some type of acknowledgement. There was, in not, there was not, in my case, a specific recognition expected for a particular poem. What I can say is that I would have liked more of a feedback from the readers regarding which poems they like and which poems they don't like and why. It's, it's nice to hear, um, where they think you feel to come across or where they felt the whole, you know, the feelings you had. So, because that's, that's a concept of poetry is pass on your feelings to other people. Uh, in your intro, you write that poetry tends to be discredited uh, in contemporary literature. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Well, I'm not sure everyone agrees on that. But I feel nowadays there's a tendency to minimize the importance of poetry as something just with aesthetic value and nothing more. When you tell a person you're a poet or that you publish a book of poetry, most people say, ah, that's nice, or, oh, as if it's a trivial feat. And that's without even establishing the value of the book or ever reading it. As an editor, I can tell you that comparatively, poetry doesn't sell as much as any other genre of literature. Not many people today make a statement such as, I'm going to the bookstore and buy a poetry book. And that is very unfortunate. When I was growing up, I have to tell you that everybody bought poetry books. You know, young people especially. I don't know about young people now buying poetry books. I'm not so sure about that. So uh, you mean when you were growing up in Italy or? When I, well, uh, I was in Italy until I was 16. When I came here also, people oh, okay. did buy poetry yeah. books. I'm yeah. talking about uh, 50 years ago and more. Uh, people, yeah. 
were proud to have a poetry book, especially if they knew the author. They were really proud and people at night, um, before going to sleep, they would read, you know, if they didn't read the Bible, they read poetry. That was the other option. So you, you figure that feelings um, of, of these people, the sensitivity to the words of the poet, as much as people reading the Bible at night, some people who were not very religious or didn't feel, you know, uh, like reading the Bible per se, they had poetry books next to it. They did not read novels at night, they read poetry because poetry was stirring their soul in a good way or in a bad way, depending upon the poet you chose and upon the type of, of uh, poems you chose, but it did stir, stir your soul and it makes you, by stirring, I don't mean it in a negative way, but mm -hmm. it made you feel like part of something else. Mm -hmm. And that, that was important. I remember um, my parents telling me that um, when they were in school, there was also maybe more of an emphasis on memorizing poems also. Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. yeah, which I don't, at least when I was in school, there wasn't as much of that uh, going on. And I don't, well, I have no idea what it's like today. So That tells you yeah. that you're younger than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, you know, I, growing up in, um, in Italy, because I was there until 16, we definitely had to, uh, memorize and I tell you one thing I, I still remember some of the poems I memorized you know from there mm -hmm. uh, the, the impact they had on me and I still feel uh, when, when I read you know mentally I read back the poem so I, I, I declamate the poem I still feel what the poet had inserted about his own feelings like one of the poems I remember is about Carducci talking to uh, Giuseppe Carducci was was a uh, one of the most important Italian poets. And he talks in a very brief form about the death of his son. He had only one son and he died at, I'm not sure if he was four or five years old, but he was very young. And this poem is, has such a strong impact on you that even now, 60 years after, I still feel that. And that, that is the value of poetry. That's what poetry is supposed to do. It's not aesthetic, it's, it's passing of feelings from the poet to the reader. Yeah, okay. Um, the majority of this collection contains poems written in Italian and translated into English, with the last section containing poems written in English and translated into Italian. Um, when did you begin to write poetry in English? And do you find any of the poems gain or lose something in translation? Most of the poems, both in English and Italian from the 60s and 70s that I wrote were destroyed or lost when I moved back to Italy in 77 to study medicine. So that's the first thing. So I did write in English at the time. I, I believe I had two poems that were saved from the early periods in English. Even the Italian ones, they all got lost. Too many times going back and forth and traveling, especially at a certain age when you're very young, things got lost. I was not concerned about being published. I just wrote because I needed to write. While I lived in Italy, I wrote a few in English, not as many as the Italian one. Uh, two of them in particular were included in the collection I published, and I believe they are the most representative of my poetry as a whole. Uh, one of them is Sleepless Night, which I'll read in a moment. Yes, so answering your question, translation usually does take away a bit from the original. There's a reason I decide, for example, to write in Italian or in English. It's, I, I could write in both languages, but there's a particular reason for writing a poem in a language or in the other one. And it's connected to the feeling of the moment as much as it is to the language itself. When I say to the feeling of the moment is when you are bilingual, for example, in, the, in this particular case, that doesn't happen to everybody because people are translated sometimes don't know the other language. But when you are a bilingual person, sometimes you think in one language, sometimes you think in the other one. If there's like a switch in there, and <laughs> really, <laughs> tell me it's not true. When I think about food, I think in Italian. I am sorry, it's very hard for me to think about food in English. Uh, it's, it's, it's very strange, but it is the reality of the fact. So uh, when you translate, 
uh, you lose some of that uh, impact that comes from, from not only from using idiomatic uh, sentences and all that, but that comes from expressing something that can only come from the original language. As a matter of fact, there are some poets who cannot be translated decently into English because they lose just about everything. I have not, for example, you know, I know people will not agree with me because this is a particular opinion, but Ungaretti, whose uh, poems may have eight, 10 words at times, when translated into English, sounds like somebody forgot the dictionary and just put words on the page. While if you read it as an Italian, you are capturing the expression of, of, of the poem. So, it, you know, I mean, this is, is a hermetic poetry. So it's, it's a particular type of poetry, but it's not only that. I've seen terrible translation, not only in poetry. For example, I've seen a translation of um, uh, Primo Levi's book. And it's not that it's written in a bad English, but it does not transpose any of the emotions that Primo Levi had in a concentration camp. It sounds like a doctor's report. And that's not what Primo Levi's book was. It, it's a book that at every other word, at every other paragraph, you get a different emotion. But in the translation, somehow it became as dull as reading a report from, a, uh, from an accident. It does, it's written in perfect English, but it does not carry the, mean, the original meaning. But anyway, I will take advantage from this moment to read two poems written in the early 80s. One of them is, was written in English and it's called A Sleepless Night. Whoops, sorry. Oh, uh, that's okay. I did gonna see all the poems. Uh, then I'm not gonna have to read them. <laughs> I think it's- Anyway. I don't see it here, okay. A slip, I'm not gonna read this in, in Italian. I'm just gonna read it in English. A Sleepless Night. A sleepless night spent struggling through the meanders of my mind in endless explorations. Innumerable considerations scattered around the stars in the sky, none with enough light of their own, but adaptable in their interconnection to show me the way. The harmony of the universe confined for a moment in the boundaries of my head explodes in its beauty. The thirst for knowledge has kneeled at my need of sensations. Bittersweet memories erase all the powerful thoughts, leaving a proven soul sighing in an exhausted body. The dread of the night has subsided and a sudden warmth has overtaken me. While the first sunbeam sneaks through the window, I remember how to sleep. Now, that is something that when translated in Italian carries the, the proper feelings, but not a hundred percent. I have to be, you know, um, sincere. Now, the other poem I'm going to read, and I'm going to read it in both languages, because somehow uh, it does is it is able in this particular case to bring to the reader or to the listener. In this case, the uh, it's called il brivido, the, sh the shiver. So uh, carries the, the, the feeling of the poor. Il brivido. L'azzurro cobalto straccia raramente il bianco tappeto. Sopra di noi il grigio che opprime. I luccichi di nave lontane riescono a penetrare l'uniformità ripetitiva del cielo, dando al paesaggio un senso di realtà. I miei sogni e le mie paure rimbalzano di nuvola in nuvola perdendosi al fine nel rinnovato candore. Ma sopisco quasi ipnotizzato. Mi risveglio al brivido che percorre la carlinga. Io e lei tremiamo all'unisono. Mi sorge il dubbio che anche l'aereo soffra freddo. Ai miei fianchi il vuoto. Il fastidio di non poter essere contraddetti. I sogni ripercorrono sentieri già conosciuti perdendosi nel nulla. The shiver. The cobalt blue rarely rips through the white carpet. 
above us the gray that oppresses. The glitter of distant ships are able to penetrate the repetitive uniformity of the sky, giving the landscape a sense of reality. My dreams and my fears bounce from cloud to cloud, losing themselves at last in their renewed candor. I doze off, almost hypnotized. I wake up to the shiver that runs along the fuselage. She and I tremble in unison. I have the doubt that the plane is also suffering from the cold. Next to me, the void. The hassle of not being able to be contradicted. The dreams we trace, paths already known, disappearing into thin hair. When I wrote this poem, it was after a trip in which I went over the Caribbean. It was a trip for work. And when I going over the Caribbean, I uh, fell asleep, like most people do in the airplane. And the shaking of the airplane woke me up. And when I woke up, there was nobody next to me or in front of me. Everybody was in the bathroom, I guess, or, or looking for the bathroom because of the, you know, the terrible shaking of the airplane. And that's what, you know, really, you know, uh, touched me in that particular case. Uh, but you can see in this case, the translation, I believe, carries in sleepless night a little less. I believe the um, uh, English version has more of a power to convey my feelings at the moment, which is, uh, you, I'm sure everybody had the sleepless nights in their, uh, you know, in their life. I had it, uh, I had many. When I was traveling for work, I used to do conventions. I used to have my own company and uh, it was medical convention. And uh, unfortunately, when you do convention, you're far away from home, you're far away from people you care for. And uh, it took a toll on me, um, being alone all the time uh, at night, and sometimes I had a hard time falling asleep. And that was one of the times. Anyway. It's, it's odd, Tiziano, because I almost asked you to read this particular poem, because this one struck a chord with me, uh, being someone who suffers from flying anxiety. So... <laughs> <laughs> hey, definitely the, the trembling, uh, yeah. The, got to me. So <laughs> um, I want to ask you about the illustrations. Um, Francesca Malera uh, provided the um, drawings for your book. Uh, how did she become involved? Well, Francesca comes from a family that had acquired some of my father's paintings and has always been an admirer of his art. They had contacted me and we had established a friendly relationship through the social, uh, you know, through Facebook and all the stuff. Knowing Francesca's work through the years, I followed her, you know, she's young, she's a young uh, person. And uh, she was, uh, at the time I, I uh, contacted her first before the book, she was in school, in, uh, in art school. And by the time she did the book, she had completed, and uh, now she's a uh, you know, professional artist. And knowing Francesca works through the years, which was admirable, I felt she could have illustrated some of the poems, so it was. I believe she did a great job. I wanted the poems to be specific to the, uh, I mean, the, the drawings specific to the poems themselves. And uh, it's, I don't remember which one is this, which poem is this, but they are specific. She picked up the feeling of the poem and illustrated it. They are not all illustrated, by the way, uh, the, uh, the poems, some of them. This is about uh, not being able to sleep at night, by the way. It's not about sleepless night, but about another uh, poem called La Notte. It's that feeling of uh, oppression when you try to sleep and you can't sleep. I'm just going to click through the other illustrations. Ooh. I was trying to find the one where the woman's face is foregrounded in your, in your book, but I'll... Uh... This is Il Passero. Here it is. As you can see, they are very detailed. And <laughs> yeah, the, the one where um, it's a rainy day and the woman's face is foregrounded, that opens the section uh, Tormented Love. Yeah. Uh, this right one is about uh, La Quinta di Nada. This is about poet's death. Okay. 
They're beautiful. Yeah, they're beautiful. They're beautiful piece of work. Beautiful art pieces. Yeah. Um, the poems in this collection were written primarily in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, when reading them, are you surprised at the thoughts and feelings of the person you were then? Uh, would you have written the poems differently now? I could not ever write the same way for a few reasons. The most important one is that my poems are the fruit of the situation I lived. And only in those moments, they could have been created as such. So I was, I'm not looking for uh, writing a poem for aesthetic value only. I'm writing what I feel at the moment. So the poems from that period have been written by a different me, a person who was young and felt all the joys and tragedies of life with a different filter. In some of them, there is a level of sadness, almost a despair that I don't wish upon anyone else. So I, when I read them back, I feel that and, and, and makes me aware of how deep was my sadness at time or my loneliness. The loneliness of emigration at the adolescent years first, and then again later back to Italy had left a heavy burden on my soul. Leaving behind the people you love is always a hard step to take. I'll read, I will read in that a poem titled The Weight that well paints my feelings at the time. It, in Italian, it's called L'Attesa. Nel buio della stanza riappaiono fantasmi lontani ormai dimenticati. Sento la profondità del nulla. Vorrei poter fuggire da me stesso, quel che sono, quello che non voglio essere. Le lenzuola mi soffocano nel loro tepore. La paura di rimanere solo a lungo e pensare e vedermi riflesso nello specchio dell'introspezione mi imperla la fronte. Ma forse è il caldo. Oppure è un sogno persistente il richiamo di un'adolescenza mai finita. Chiudo gli occhi sperando che tutto cambi. Tutto è sempre uguale. Il sonno. Sì, il sonno cancellerà tutto. The wait. In the darkness of the room we appear far away ghost by now forgotten. I feel the depth of emptiness. I wish I could escape from myself, what I am, what I don't want to be. The sheets suffocate me in their warmth. The fear of being alone and think and seeing myself reflected in a mirror of introspection beads my forehead. But perhaps it's the heat. Or is it the dream, persistent call of a never ended adolescence? I close my eyes, hoping that everything will change. Everything is always the same. This sleep, yes, this sleep will erase everything. So that that uh, gives you an idea of uh, the, the feeling of loneliness. And it, it's always a night. I'm sure uh, people that, um, they suffer from any kind of uh, angst or anxiety coming from uh, being away from home, being away from the family and so on and so forth. Um, feeling, feel that more at night because during the day you're busy, you're doing things. You don't have time to think, to feel, you know, to feel lonely and all that because you're doing things. Especially at that time when I wrote this, I was uh, doing conventions and I had uh, to do sign contract and prepare and all that. So my days were long days, maybe 18 hours, 20 hours. And my sleep was short. It was mostly in hotels in England, in Germany, you know, in Israel, wherever I was. And at that time, so strangely, instead of being exhausted and tired, that's when the angst that comes from being away from people that you love or, or, or all the thoughts about, uh, the things you did, the things you, you could have done, or any any other doubt that comes in your mind comes at that moment. And you know, they tell you that it's specific, that you, you could avoid it just by thinking positive, but it's easier said than done when you're young, you you don't have you don't go through that process. I may do that now because uh, I'm a little old. <laughs> anyway, that's that's the concept. In your introduction, you mentioned that in writing verse, uh, there are canons and stylistic reference points that one should follow 
what were your reference points for this collection? Well, justice is the difference between composing a symphony, an opera, a concerto, and a song, whether it is blues, pop, or jazz. So there are different poetry styles. The classic ones who follow metrics and uh, count syllables can easily be compared to writing classical music. While free verse, which I use, is more like jazz. The impact that the poem has on the reader, though, in my opinion, is to transpose the feeling of the poet had while writing. Just like a painting, he has to make you feel to be able to recreate the moment. If he does not, then you feel as a poet, regardless of the style. On that thought, I could read you Stardust, which was written in Italian as Polvere di Stelle. And that will give you an idea of um, when I call it, it's like jazz. I mean that because the, uh, the impact should be similar to feeling a, a piece of jazz or a song. It's called Polvere di Stelle. Polvere di Stelle che trasuda come palpito inconsueto da una pelle confine con il nulla. Esistere, respirare, accorgersi d'essere chi ero e chi sarò per un periodo indeterminato in ambedue le direzioni temporali. Terra limbo, cuscinetto dimensionale tra insapute collocazioni eteree, il tocco divino in netto contrasto con le nostre interpretazioni. Riciclaggio d'anime nell'eterno vuoto, riempito solo dalla mia fantasia e dal nulla, entità incontrastata nella mente umana. Il calco d'Adamo è in me e riesco ad annullare tutte le mie aspirazioni autolesionistiche. Ripenso ad un giorno bambino nel Duomo, ritorno e ritrovo me stesso, seduto lì, con la faccia immersa nelle mani, piangendo come allora, senza lacrime. Una forza riesce a farmi capire l'incomprensibile. Io, granello di sabbia, per un attimo spiaggia, oceano, universo. Stardust. Stardust, exuding as the unusual heartbeat from a skin boundary with a nothing. To exist, to breathe, to notice of being who I was and who I will be, for an indefinite period in both temporal directions. Limbo planet, dimensional buffer between undiscovered ethereal collocations, the divine touch in sharp contrast with our interpretations. Recycling of souls in the, in the eternal void, filled only by my imagination and the nothing, an opposed entity in the human mind. The cast of Adam is in me and I can undo all my self-defeating aspirations. I think back to a day as a child in the cathedral and I turn and find myself sitting there with a face immersed in the hands, crying as then without tears. A force can make me understand the incomprehensible. I, grain of sand, for a moment, beach, ocean, universe. And that is what I would call jazz <laughs> when you're talking about composition. Um, it's uh, free verse is misunderstood at times. It's, people feel that free verse uh, is just writing down sentences that one feels and that's it. No, free verse has a rhythm. The rhythm is dictated by your feelings and also by the knowledge of writing. I mean, there, there are two different items. You have to know how to write, but uh, unless you're an instinctive, you, are, you have that talent to write free verse and convey the rhythm, which is like a song. When you read back a poem, it follows like a song. And so that's, that's what I was talking about, following the stylistic choices. You know, or did you find this one in particular to be maybe a little more difficult to translate in English? Because I'm looking at line, a line like boundary with the nothing. Yes. Um, yeah. The, the, the nothing, which is the nothingness, you know, other, and otherwise said, uh, does not really 100% reflect nulla, you know. 
yeah. Nulla, Nulla is the void. Uh, so yes, it was. This was a very difficult poem to translate. It really was. This uh, Sleepless Night was hard to translate into Italian. This was difficult. There is also a couple of other poems which were very, also because they are they are complex poems. They are not uh, simple mm. poems because the the feelings and the thoughts that dictated me to write them were complex. They were not simple feelings. Uh, or you know, you have a headache, you feel bad uh, because something happened. It was more complex than that. This is a uh, uh, more of an existentialist crisis, and uh, because of that, it, it is harder to translate. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of the poems are about feelings, which you know we've talked about already. But you also have in some of the poems there are observations on society. Um, yeah. Could you talk more yeah. about that? Yeah, there's a section in books dedicated to it. And um, each poem is quite different from the other one because they actually snapshots of particular uh, people or situations. I'll, I'll read you, for example, one of them, which is Ifolle, the madman. And I will give you an idea what, what the observations are. Ifolle. Continua a parlare, convinto forse di essere ascoltato. I sogni di gioventù, svaniti come le speranze per un futuro tristemente presente, diventate realtà nelle focose ringhe, creazioni improvvisate delle quali solo la lucidità del folle può darne un'interpretazione, fantasmagoriche illusioni che vivono con lui mentre conversa, ride, risponde a domande mai poste, si compiange, e se ne va, spettro di un uomo che ha scelto la via più breve verso la felicità. The madman. He keeps talking, perhaps convinced to be heard. The dreams of youth vanished as hopes for a future sadly pre present became a reality in his fiery harangues. Improvised creations of which only the lucidity of the insane can give an interpretation. Phantasmagoric illusions living with him while he converses, laughs, answers questions never asked, pities himself, and leaves. Spectrum of a man who chose the shortest route to happiness. Now, this was written after I stopped and observed a <laughs> madman, I call him, I, 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 today they would call them homeless. At that time, I, I thought he was a madman, but uh, who obviously had mental issues and who uh, was making statements that uh, were very, very scary at times. And at the same time, he seemed to be happy with himself. He seemed to be happy with um, explaining these crazy thoughts to the world. I guess it was a point. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> anyway, do you have any other questions, Phil? Well, actually, I wanted to open the floor to uh, our Zoom attendees. Uh, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask uh, Tiziano about his? Um, doesn't have to be this collection in particular, just about writing in general. Uh, you can either unmute yourself or just type it in the chat box. Um, I have a question. First of all, that was really lovely. Um, thank you so much, Tiziano. And plus, I love your um, <clears throat> pronuncia milanese when you read in Italian. Um, my question is this. So, you know, when we're writing prose, how we go back and edit and revise and so forth. But when you're writing poetry and your goal is to get that raw emotion out, which is in essence what makes poetry universal is because it touches that kind of instinctual feeling in other people who read it or listen to it. How do you balance revision with maintaining that original raw emotion that you get down on paper? Well, in my case, I can, I can only speak from my personal experience, obviously. Um, my editing only consisted in finding 
uh, the proper expression, the proper um, word, um, which I probably couldn't find at the particular moment that I wrote. I had a feeling, I, I, I knew there was a word and I found something, but really needed a synonym. And I could only find it when I got home and my mind was clear and I could go back and, and rearrange that and change the word to a synonym, which was more accurate of the feeling of the moment. Obviously that cannot, cannot and shouldn't be done 10 years from that moment because you're gonna lose something. You're, gonna, you're going to become, <laughs> going to become an editor and the editor only looks at whether the structure is correct sometimes the structure may not be correct but it does a better job of conveying the the, the feeling so uh, if you do it from too many years apart you do find yourself in in attempting to rewrite something that cannot be rewritten because you're not the same person you know you're, you're not suffering from that particular uh, either sadness or happiness or whatever it is that, that trigger that emotion of the moment. So it's not a good idea for me to go back. For my personal experience, other people may feel different. I'm sure the people that write poetry are, are more for uh, conveying aesthetic issues and, and, and uh, uh, they're concerned more about, uh, you know, the verses and uh, the rhymes and all that. I do a lot more editorial work on their work because they need to and they have number of syllables so it's not so random okay but this is just like jazz when you write a piece and i always compare to jazz for a reason uh, because when you write a piece in jazz you, you don't go 10 years after and and, and rewrite it and you know do all completely editing because you wrote it with a particular feeling of that moment and the same thing when you do a painting you don't go and touch up a painting 10 years after you may go a week after to finish up certain details in the painting. It's the same thing with the poem. You know, it's it, it's it's a matter of of um, being able to keep that original feeling, even with a little editing, because sometimes you do make even mistakes, and you're not even worried about grammatical mistakes, but you even typos. You know, so I still find typos in my own thing, my own writing. And you, you do need to go and edit it, but not change the whole structure of the poem, not do the editing because you want to make it look good. It has to convey your feeling. If you make it look good, sometimes you lose the original feeling. And that's the, the fear. Uh, and that's why I, I try not to, to um, consider myself a poet because poets, uh, the, all the poets that I know at least tend to to be very picky about the syllables and whether they should re-edit this or this doesn't sound as it should be. And, you know, they keep on changing their poems and that's that's not how I see poetry. Poetry for me, for me, and I'm not saying that for anybody else, but for me, it's an expression of my feelings. If I, when I was reading, was able to pass on to you and to anybody else who's listening, um, the feelings I had, or something similar, then I feel that I, I got hundred percent what I wanted to do, and that's what you know the poem is about. Okay. Now take take a small break. I'm going to read two poems in English only, which are more recent from a recent production. I, I try not to be too complicated. Also, when I write po poetry. Uh, all, uh, other than the existentialist uh, poetry, which is complicated because existentialism is complicated. But uh, I try to be as simple as possible because I would like the reader to capture what I feel. And I, I think that these two poems give, uh, one is a, a semi-negative view and one is actually a very positive view of my status as a 69 years old human being. The first one is called The Mirror. I stare at the reflection. It doesn't move. His face carries the signs of time. He's frowning, showing disgust. But why? Who is this other me to judge? 
I once was a child, a young man full of hopes and dreams, and now I have to suffer his contempt and his sneers as if he was feeling sorry for me. But the real me is inside, young as always, though father and survivor, ready to climb the highest mountain, to play with the sand, to live in a castle without being judged for what he is not anymore. That reflection in the mirror. So that is, uh, I think, is self-explanatory, I hope. <laughs> and the other one is called Forgotten. And it's about how you can feel things, um, feel certain emotions at any age. Apparently forgotten, concealed by the drudgery of every day's reprise, with the game of survival, it lies deep in my heart, intact in its purity, renewed by a mysterious and timeless impulse that I try unendingly to explain. Common words seem to fracture the essence of this untainted desire, passion, and unreasonable force that I dare to call love. Sometimes I wonder whether I try too hard to explain the unexplainable. So this is, uh, these two poems are more recent and they are more wise because they see the world as it really is. They see the world through uh, a different set of glasses and uh, concerning with uh, the way you feel and concerning with the reality of life. So anyway, anybody else has any more questions? If not, I'll conclude with another poem. It's up to you. Um, silence and silence will be. So we'll go to another poem. I, I actually have one question before you start. Yes, please, um, please ask. What advice would you give to, I guess, younger people who want to, to write poems? Write what you feel. Don't be concerned of what other people think and say. Do, do concern yourself when people, when everybody you show your poems tells you that that poem is ugly or that poem is terrible because I don't know what you're saying, but if you write what you feel, that will not happen. Mm. If you actually convey your feelings, read, read back your poem, see if you feel the same way when you read it back. And then if you do that, then you have achieved it. And feel good about writing porch. Yes, Raylene, I see you raising your hand. So speaking of feelings again, Tiziana, I'm just wondering, are there any poems that you've written that are so personal you would not want to share them? Well, there are poems that are, did not appear in the book. And, you know, I, I would say a lot of the poems that I destroyed, <laughs> they were like, they were like, um, <laughs> I, I know, for example, uh, painters who uh, uh, painted and then destroyed their paintings. Or I actually know a composer. Well, I don't know him. He, he died away, died uh, over 100 years ago. But who, uh, at the end of his life, decided to destroy all of his uh, librettos, operas, and all that, uh, because he felt that they were too personal and there was something in there that he didn't want people to see whatever the reason being. Uh, so we'll never know because we don't know what, what they sounded like and what they were talking about. But it is, yes, there, there's always something that you don't want other people to read. Um, those are the feelings, the emotions that are so strong. They are, they are like a tidal wave in your life and that go beyond what you want to share. I mean, we do always have a dark place in our soul. And they, when you say dark, people think of something negative. It's a dark place because it holds some of these tidal waves that occur in our life. Um, I am sure, for example, when my father passed away, I could have written about that. I didn't. I wrote about the fact that I couldn't write any more poetry. I could not put myself even to write about it, 
I had all these feelings, I had all these thoughts in my head, but I didn't feel it would be right for me to do that. It was like taking advantage of a particular situation. But there are poems definitely that I wrote, especially in my early years that I destroyed because uh, they, they were quite too personal, yes. I'm sure everybody has that uh, when they write poems, yeah. Would you care for a poem? I am going to read another one that is quite recent in English. Those eyes, those eyes, even now showing that feeling of a long time gone, those eyes displaying the power that made them dear to my heart. Those eyes carry the burden, but still know how to smile. Those eyes possessing within them the sky, your universe and mine. Those eyes forgiving and tender, unchanged through time. Those eyes are beautiful, but most of all, are still mine. So, and that tells you that uh, people still have feelings when they get older. That's one thing that um, it, you were talking, Raylene, about what should you tell uh, young poets? Actually, it was Phil. Um, the point is that they, what they have to be aware is that all the struggles, internal struggles that people go through, are not necessarily tied to young age. People say, well, adolescent, oh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy period of your life. You go through all these emotions and it's, it's crazy. But I tell you one thing, my strongest emotions were not in my adolescent years. They were in my 20s and 30s. So everybody's different. But I can tell you that even now, and I'm sure when, God willing, I will get older. The emotions are there, the feelings. They might be different because they channel differently. Uh, maybe now they ch they're, they're channeled toward a grandchild, or you know, it, they're, they're just channeled differently because we evolved, but we still have a lot of emotions in us. And if you're young and you realize that, then when you write, you, you do realize that people that will read will understand you. Not because they are, if you're 16, everybody that reads is going to be 16. And not because necessarily they lived the, your particular experience, but because they are feeling something on their own. So they can capture your angst, your anxiety, your happiness, or whatever else it is, or love. Love, love never ends. It starts when you're young and you are in your mother's hands and you're looking on her face and it only ends at the end of your life. If you don't carry love for the rest of your life, yeah, you're, you're never gonna be a poet. So it's, there are two things that go along very well, poetry and love. Anybody else's questions? Phil? So if you're a robot, you probably can't write poetry, great poetry, <laughs> as it boils down to. If, you're, if you are, <laughs> A cold person, I, I, I wouldn't call it somebody a robot because everybody has feelings, but there are people that have very little feelings on the surface. They, mm. they were stunted because some emotional issues on that. You can still write poetry. The poetry will, will reflect that. The poetry reflects the depth of your emotions, mm. whether they are just superficial, they're very deep, whether you, you, you are a person concerned with, uh, with your existence, concerned with finding God or finding uh, the absence of God, uh, whether you, you, you're looking for love, uh, whether you're a lonely person, it doesn't matter. All this is lived differently by everybody. We all write the same things, but differently because we live them differently. The word love can mean different things for everybody else you know, than you, you know, and so does poetry. And that's why I, I, in my introduction, I say poetry, it, it's a need to write. It, it, it's something that, that it should be almost compulsory. And, you, and now my time, they used to make you write poetry in school so that you learn that you can express feelings. Because when you write prose at times, and, and there's nothing wrong with prose, you can actually write poetry in prose, by the way. You know, um, but 
when you write prose most of the time, some of the emotions are lost because you're concerned with style, mm. with, the, with the person that reads. You're concerned with the with the structure. You 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 know you got to have an intro and a body and a and, you know a conclusion. Uh, poetry is not like that. Poetry, you're just explaining your feeling. Mm -hmm. Yes, you still have a structure in there, but it's not as rigid. So yes, feelings feelings is the essence of poetry and at the bottom line, you know. Okay. I believe we're, we're done for the night. Uh, yeah. Thank you again, Tiziano. This is wonderful. And um, thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed the, the program tonight.